but um, just posting a few links up there so people know I'm actually doing something because I forgot to uh, do other posting of that sort. Um, and let's see here. There we go. So uh, tonight's going to be different in, uh, different in that I am not um, drawing a commission. I am just going to talk about drawing. And, uh, and one of my favorite books to recommend for young artists is this one. Drawing the Hidden Figure by Jack Ham, two M's. Now, this is a soapy up. I've had this since I think... I want to say the early 80s, um, but I think it was more like mid-late 80s. I'm old. Give me a break. This book, at the time I bought it, was in its, I think, 58th? Sorry, 48th printing. I don't know if you can see that. 48th printing. My God. Um, okay, this looked through me. Yeah, it was originally created in 1963. And uh, it shifted from its original publisher to Peregrine, um, which I think at one point was owned by Dover. I could be absolutely wrong on that. Um, I had just recently given a copy, ordered a copy and given it to a friend uh, for their child who was really into drawing. And the newer edition looks like it's print on demand. Um, the print quality is more or less the same. I think I think this earlier edition, the, the darks are like the blacks are closer to black. These are like what ninety percent black. Uh, so I think it's probably closer to 85, 80 in the the edition, the print on demand edition. Uh, and it's actually also slightly smaller, like almost like like a quarter inch on either side. They just shrunk it down. Um, so you know. I would, if I were you, I would look for like a slightly older used edition. Look at the table of contents in this. Look at this. And then it jumps right in the head, which is what I'm going to focus on tonight. Um, I think this is, I think, I almost think that if, if you have a young artist and they, they love drawing, period, this is the book to get them. If they love drawing comics, even if they love drawing manga, which are, are also comics, uh, get them get them how to draw comics the Marvel way by John Buscema. It's uh, it covers less drawing than this book does, but it actually introduces some, uh, some valuable information for somebody who wants to be a comic book artist. So somebody who just wants to draw, get this book. Somebody who wants to draw comics, get how to draw comics the Marvel way, and this book. And um, going beyond that, there's a massive list of incredibly talented uh, art instructors from George Bridgman to Andrew Loomis and so many others. Uh, and I might, do, I might do Sunday night sessions talking about those guys and the various different things that uh, they teach in their books that I particularly like. Now, one of, one of the things I will be doing is um, uh, about a month or so ago, I, I stumbled across all my class notes from when I used to teach. And with them were all my class notes for this uh, online course I did on drawing hands. And, and I mean, none of this stuff's been available. I haven't taught for over 10 years. Um, I, I quit craft C around that long ago too. And so all this stuff is just lying there. And I think I'm going to make an effort when, when, when some time frees up, which is always the case, make an effort and um, uh, do a series of videos specifically on teaching that information. Some of the stuff is just hand-eye coordination tips, like drawing, you know, one inch cubes in rows and columns in your sketchbook, just to gain more line and hand-eye coordination um, to actual like anatomical breakdown to where I've taken like lessons from three or four different art instructors. Um, and I brewed them into my own approach to drawing things. But uh, so we're going to talk about heads. And um, should I bridge me into this at this point? That seems like I'm going to focus on this. Um, so here he's starting with uh, very common, you know, draw an egg shape for a head. 
then you divide your egg shape into all, all these very specific measurements. Your, your center point for the eyes become the pupils. Uh, a specific line becomes the underside of the nose. A specific line becomes the mouth. Um, then you increase, you add somewhat more details with an eye towards where you're going with it. And then you get a finished piece. Uh, it's kind of cartoonish. He, has, he actually has a pretty good book on cartooning, but it's very period oriented. Uh, very much of its time in the early 60s, as are many of the drawings and fashion senses here when he goes way into the back on um, drawing clothes and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it, it's like, you know, that easy if you're drawing like, this is a common head on headshot that you'd see in comic after comic after comic. So, you know, understanding these proportions is important. And here he is doing it somewhat more mathematically uh, drawing a line, these are, you know, your eye widths. You draw a circle based on the width of the head, not the head being five eyes wide. Uh, and then you extend it by two eye widths down to get the chin. Um, and then you, I mean, you're almost like doing like a bicycle type thing where you got a big wheel going to a smaller wheel with a chain here. Um, and you, you get all these steps, which are far more steps than the previous edition, but all these these much more accurate bits of information coming around into drawing a completed head along with a whole bunch of examples of different ways you can draw eyes and eyebrows different ways you can draw the cheekbones different ways you can draw the chin and different ways you can draw the lips and he, he does this in a very and here he is he's doing yet another another way of breaking down and drawing the head on front but all of it is is finding out your proportions on an egg shape that at your early, early stage of drawing, you may not be able to draw that egg shape. You may not be able to draw that circle. You may not be able to actually visualize those elements, but it's a great way to start. You really need to start uh, with that and uh, learn those proportions. You become incredibly important. Um, then we got, oh my God, then we got this. This is, this is terrifying, isn't it? This is so terrifying, but it's, it's brilliant in the same point. And, and there's another, I think I posted a little while ago on social media where, where he talked about the head measurement for full figures. So he put heads in the figures, but here he is, he's using the eye to show the distance, the usual distance, everything is from everything else. So here's the head, five eyes wide. Okay. Center point of your eye is one eye away from the bottom of your nose. So you get a little triangle in there. Um, he also talks about that triangle being in there, triangle the width of the eyes down to the bottom of the lip. Um, and you know, the, the bottom of the lip is one eye width from the bottom of the nose. Um, it, it's, it's, it can get ludicrous, but this is a good, almost like mnemonic to, to memorize these, these proportions. Um, and the goal with proportions is to memorize them. You, it's, it's not something you want to be stopping in your drawing and say, I gotta go double check those proportions in my textbooks or my anatomy books. It's, it's so much better to have them understood. And I'm gonna get into how learning this becomes a key component, this and other proportions, becomes a key component to the unconscious aspect of drawing. Here's some more, a bunch of different head shapes. I assume they're all based on photographs because they look like really quick, sketchy, guttural expressions of the line to get, get those faces across and they're bang on. Uh, then he does something a little goofy with the eye. Um, it's Again, it's great for kids and, and young, young people. Uh, you want to learn these shapes instead of that, that weird kind of like manga parallel lines with a pupil in it. Um, which is, it's great once you've learned how to draw the eye that you can go to that and make it work. But starting off there means that you're never actually learning the structure of the eye, how the lid works and all that stuff. Um, some more realistic drawings, a little tonal stuff. I think he's, he's using a, um, a black colored pencil or grease pencil on coquille board, which is like a pebble board. Like it has a real heavy toothy surface so you can get, immediately get like, um, it's almost like a half tone pattern right out of the line work. Um, a lot of artists in the, uh, um, I think, 40s through 70s worked with that until color became the norm. 
um, very, very detailed information on like how the eyelashes, eyelids, and everything work. He doesn't quite put as much thickness on the upper eyelid that is really there. And this shape going across the eye is almost accurate. It's, it's, it's not quite there. And in this one here, um, he's squishing the pupil. I don't know why he did that. Um, but if it's, if it's rolling down that far, because it's, it's on a sphere, it's a circle on a sphere. If it rolls down that far, um, ah, maybe I should correct it in my own, should I correct this in my own book? <laughs> That's ego. Here we go. So this, this will draw it nice and dark. So if the eye is in this socket and the pupil is down here, this is going to come down more like that. Um, and that'll be more like that. That's been bothering me for years. I don't know why I let it slide till now. So, so there's that. Um, the eye wheel, just a whole bunch of different eyes. Some of it is, he eh, goes in with more proportions um, in the measurements of different points on the eye. Again, this stuff is very period specific for drawing a very uh, simplified stylized eye. Um, it's good information to learn, um, to get the understanding in. Again, great for young artists. It's, it's in many ways, it's oversimplifying while complicating certain aspects, if that makes sense. Uh, a whole range of lips. Um, he doesn't really get into how lips are constructed. He, he kind of sort of does a shape here. But he doesn't explain how the lip wraps around the mouth and all that stuff. He's again, he's just giving you the information that runs counter to a lot of ins instinctual ways some people draw features. Like you've seen child's drawings where they don't understand how to capture the depth. Uh, again, like page of noses. Um, I'm going to go a little faster through here because he does uh, very simplistic things on ears. Basically, almost like a page and a bunch of key different things. Here he is doing expressions of hair, which is not really drawing real hair as much as very, very stylized hair, which is perfectly fine if you're drawing from imagination. More hair. Um, finding any, this is, this is actually strangely advanced, but it's, it's incorporating something that the hidden circles aspect of it, circles I don't like. I don't like circles, I'll get into that in a bit later. Um, angles I like, blocks I like, um, and, and sketchy blobs I like. I'm going to get into that. Uh, talking about foreshortening, which is good again at a very introductory level. Uh, and here he is, he's doing a, after spending all that time on the front of the face and the features, here he is doing a profile, which is very similar to the Bridgman block. Um, I think there's a bit of a problem in how he's doing the female head here, where it's like he's literally putting the entire bottom part of her face straight up and down, which is not really often the case, um, but I, you know, we all develop our quirks as we go. Um, in terms of the female faces here, where he's got all these profiles, where you see the angle there from nose tip to chin, that's more typical. Nose tip to chin, that's more typical. Still a slight incline there, still a slight incline there, or decline, I guess, decline going away. And there is, this is closest to what he does in the block, in terms of that, that straight up and down mouth, which is, you know, perf perfectly possible, and it happens a lot. But generally speaking, the, the, a woman's chin is, is um, receding away from the furthest, po furthest most point of her face, which is her nose. Um, differences in male-female profiles, again, another young artist thing. Uh, very classic male, tough guy, white collar businessman type face he was seen in comics and advertising during his era. Uh, some interesting examples of different approaches to ink. Here's, here's, uh, done with cloth tied over wooden match, ink partly dry. I mean, it's like, <laughs> what? Um, you know, try to, my friend, Mike Ruth. If I pointed this out, out to him, and I said, yeah, you know, if you took a wood match with the ink partly dry, with a cloth over it, and then use it almost like a spongy brush, you'd get that. And he'd go, well, can I find one in the wild? 
if you don't like cars, you get that. Um, planes, it doesn't really do a good job. I'm looking at the planes of the head here. Um, but again, this is this is really almost like a more introductory thing for artists. Uh, so they, if they can absorb this, they're ready for more advanced takes on everything he covers here. The semi-cartoon head, again, he's got a book on cartooning, which is, it's got some really good information in, but um, I'll be absolutely honest, I don't like the way he cartoons. Uh, it's not for me. Um, here you get, you get a more confirmed the photo reference and a whole bunch of different age faces. Age information on faces is great. There's actually whole books about that. Now, I mentioned earlier, I was talking about where he used actual heads to give you the proportions. And this, what, ever since I've seen this, it's stuck with me. Um, at some point, I'm going to do a video on what I call the eight head stick, um, which is the ideal, you know, if you're placing figures in depth and perspective, you, dr you draw a stick and you divide it into eight equal portions, which is enough to do with the vertical stick. Um, and then you have portions for the figure. And even if the figure isn't standing vertically, having those proportions there and you drawing a figure doing an action or something around that eight head stick, you have a better sense of the proportions you're going to be using. Uh, here he is doing uh, is a little bit of skeletal information, like the bare minimum. Um, it's, it's, it's almost like uh, mandatory that he has to actually put a skeleton in since it's ostensibly an anatomy book. If I take like my favorite anatomy book, um, it's actually by German. I had it closer to my desk. Gottfried Bamas, uh, Complete Guide to Anatomy for Artists and Illustrators. I think it's still in press, in print. Um, and this guy's, oh wait, oh here, just look. This is, this is the book. Okay, so this book, I will be, or I will be uh, talking about this book in the future. But his, his, uh, depth of anatomy. I mean, he's not even talking about like detailed anatomy to well into the book. He's talking about gross mass shapes. Look at that. Look at that. Clay maquette. Yeah, here you see, here he's using a skeleton as a mannequin, essentially. A simplified skeleton. Um, which is which is brilliant. If you can understand these skeletal masses underneath the figure, everything else becomes easier. God, I love this book so much. Proportions over age. Different age proportions. Photographs, oh, I probably should skip through the photographic section. Uh, YouTube and everything. Uh, sculptures, showing the work in, in process. Lots of masterwork. Walk, it's actually walk cycles for animators, right there. There you go. Uh, again, photograph, lots of text describing everything he's thinking about. Looking at the figure starting and running. Uh, if you have my bridge, that's a good thing to look at too. And we're still not into skeletal anatomy. Let me see here. Let's see if I find first bit of skeletal anatomy. Showing a lot of how the body's moving in relationship to everything. I know the leg, he starts in the legs in pretty detailed stuff. When I was teaching, I relied on this a lot when I, when I, when I was allowed to teach anatomy. Here, let's just start this. Look, look at his, his, the way he's constructing this kneecap, where his lines are rendering the changes in the planes and the directions of the bones. So you really understand how these bones are all connecting and interacting with each other. And he does the same sort of line work rendering the muscle and flesh over top of those those bones. And he, he's like drawing, draws a leg, draws the bone, draws the leg, draws the bone. And he does it again and again. These are great exercises. I've done it a few times from the model, sometimes from photographs, just to make sure I understand what's happening structurally. And oh, so much nudity. Um, you know, all these all these figures. You even got color here showing how the muscles and the fascia are all interacting here. 
here, look at this. I'm drawing it a pelvis. So many times I see the worst possible. And you know what? I'm spending too much time on bombas. I'm going to be doing more stuff with bombas later. All right. The simplified figures. Uh, a weirdly complicated angular um, uh, construction, which is, I could go into, there is, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name right now. Uh, there's a very uh, classic uh, approach to uh, using lines to develop a figure. It's so, it's on my shelf if I wanted to take a break to look at it. But again, I, I'd probably end up digressing way too much. Um, here he is talking about different drawing principles. He's talking about the T, but basically how things run into overlap. Step at a time sketching, join the arms, legs of the torso, kind of. I mean, I mean, the ab stuff is a little cartoon. It's it's like he, he understands how to draw superficially well, but as soon as he gets into the, the nuts and bolts of anatomy, he seems like maybe maybe he's not as uh, as comfortable as he should be, which is fine. Um, I mean, his understanding of the pelvis is that that's a drawing of a pelvis. Um, he, he has it in the right spot. He has the uh, the femur connecting in the right way. Um, it's not, it's not bad information. It's not like Hogarth, um, who I, I kept one Hogarth anatomy book, his book on drawing hands, just to sh be, be able to show students how much shit he was making up. Um, with him, he's not making up stuff. He's, he's doing his best to simplify information for beginning artists. Hogarth would manufacture reference points within a drawing. Um, and that reference point would only exist if the figure was in that pose at that time. Um, so in terms of drawing from anatomy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend Hogarth. I mean, you work with what you can get, but oh, weird neck information here, the way it's presented. But um, there's no lies in the handbook. The Hogarth book is full of lies until you look, he has a book on light and shadows, which is not bad. And his drapery book is not bad. Now, my saying not bad isn't praise. It's just that they're not bad. There are no lies. There's better books elsewhere. Um, and I'm going to go through this fast because I actually want to get the drawing. So I don't want to do that in the long time. We're already half hour in. Um, and flip through. This is his surface anatomy section. A nice little section on the hands. Again, this isn't the way I draw hands. Um, but it's a great way to learn the proportions of the hand which are far more important to drawing hands well later. So if you can get the measure, uh, the understanding of how hands uh, fit together, how long your fingers are compared to the palm and all that stuff. If you, if you can get that basic information, this is a really good way to actually, like if you practice and draw these as exercises, you will get a better understanding of the proportions of your hands. Uh, here's a bunch of poses of hands. Um, there's so many books on uh, hand drawing. Um, if you go to any sort of uh, reference sites, um, there's like, you'll be able to buy photo packs of hands. So you got like lots of hands reference. I have books on hands reference. Um, so many, so many times I do not have the time to look up reference to draw hands. But when I do, it's weirdly enough, if I, if I can think of like, oh, don't I have a picture of a hand doing exactly this in this book? And I'll go look and if I can find it, then, oh my God, I saved myself maybe 40 minutes of time. So now I can draw this hand in 10 minutes instead of 40 minutes struggling until it gets right. It's a nice work on the legs with, again, the skeletal anatomy, which is a real nice, nice bit. A little bit on the, the front of the knee turning into a block. Um, all good stuff. So being able to draw from your imagination speeds everything up. Having a good reference library that you know where everything is speeds everything up. Um, it's, good. It's, it's really good because I believe he goes right from this section on feet to shoes, which is great because this was the first anatomy book I saw spend this much time on clothing, costume. I see him like do like gestural like folds and stuff, but no one ever went, okay, here's your foot in silhouette. You know, make sure it's sitting planted properly. There's your toes in it. You don't need your toes if you understand the foot better. And there's your shoe on top of it. And, you know, pants used to be, what was that called? It? Um, what was that peg? I have a feeling that that's an inappropriate term. Um, cuffed. 
<laughs> Again, more cuffed pants. That was the, that was the thing in the sixties, man. Um, this actually, the weird thing is, when he when I saw this drawing for the first time, I came up with a completely different way to draw feet. Um, a lot of it is, again, based on understanding of what's happening here. What Frank Frazetta was doing when he was drawing feet, what George Bridgman does when he draws feet. But seeing the silhouette of where the foot or the shoe is planted on the ground did more for me to be able to draw feet on the plane than anything else. And lots more shoe, shoe drawings, a little more indications to know that you're getting your shoe correctly. Um, again, this, is, this really predates the idea of, of runners being common fashion wear. It's all dress shoes or casual um, shoes with uh, laces. And here we go, diving right into costume, simple folds and body protrusions. So you can see all the folds here. This is, again, the fashion is from the early, early 60s, late 50s maybe. This really, I mean, this looks like a, a 1960s Superman. This is Clark Kent looking through binoculars. Why? He's pretending he's not Superman. Uh, a whole bunch of quick, simple sketches, putting clothing over the figure. Different ways their clothes get cut and put on. Again, the fashions are, are strange, but all this information is immediately applicable to what people are wearing these days. Um, doing the same thing with male fashion. Folds in a jacket, which is, I mean, honestly, a lot of people struggle with folds on coats. They don't understand the thickness of the material. They don't understand where the pressure points, where the pulls and the snags happen to create like uh, folds. And here it is, all in one page. You want to do all the arms, all the folds you need in arm, right there in that page. And then making folds easier to draw the weird little, like, almost a fish thing. Um, this, and then this thing here, it's like, ooh. This, this reminds me, there was um, an artist named Don Simpson. He could draw like crazy, but he over-rendered everything to the point where it was like, what the hell, man? This looks like a Don Simpson drawing. This looks like um, closer to Mazzuccelli or Dick Giordano. Um, yeah, so I really recommend um, spend a half hour on this. I really recommend this book. If you have a young artist uh, in your life that doesn't know where to start, they don't have an art program, they don't have uh, art teachers on hand, um, this is, I think, the best starter book. And honestly, what, if you're going to give them this book, give them a nice big uh, sketchbook, preferably one the same size as, as the book. And just tell them to do, um, follow the advice I was given when I was first given George Bridgman. Just read everything, draw every page, and just go, literally go through the whole book. It, it's not sexy, but. If you study everything, you practice these exercises, um, you will get, you will learn, you will improve, you will get better and better and better. And yeah, so yeah, recommending that. Yeah, I don't know if there's any chat going on because I'm not seeing any messages. Why chat? There we go. Oh, here we go. Hello, Edison. Very cool. Finally, okay. I had live chat communication turned on. That's terrible of me. Um, I thought I had it on. Because look at nobody's talking. So if anyone has questions about any of this, um, I'm right here. I can I can answer them all. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna do a couple of head drawings, and I'm gonna go through the process I draw them at. I wonder if this is will this show up. That might show up well. It's kind of light, isn't it? And what I'm going to switch to that. What was that pencil I just used uh, to darken stuff in? Probably just absolutely tossed it aside. Oh, here it is. There we go. All right, so this is a 14B. This is as dark a pencil as a, a pencil can get. This is from the new, well, you know, from last year. Um, Let's see if you can read that. Oops, I think focused. Ooh, the camera's not out of focus. Okay, so this is a pit 
graphite matte. So this is as dark as it can get without the shine of typ typical graphite, which, I mean, it makes sense that graphite shines because it's generally a lubricant. So when I'm drawing a head, I start by just drawing masses. So I don't, I don't do that egg shape. And part of that is because, uh, again, uh, there's no more reference points for me as an artist here than there is in this blobby shape here. Uh, other than I'm immediately engaging my mind's eye or that inner camera uh, to get a sense of like what part of the head I'm looking at. So yeah, so I immediately, I just rough out this place. And this is where studying those proportions really comes in handy. Um, I could break this down into very, very detailed uh, proportions. But really, since I have the mass, what I, I most have to worry about is a center line coming down to the point of the chin. Where the side plane of the forehead comes down to the cheekbone. And then I can start doing things I also know. Because, I mean, not only do I you know, study my ham and my leanness and all that stuff, I also have things like, you know, this big dumbass skull here on ham. And I've been studying and doing paintings and drawings of this for. I had this one. Did I have this one in college or after college? Let's say I got this after college, because I don't think I knew about these until after college. Yeah. Um, we break? I broke it once before. Um, and yeah, and it's like just understanding where the jaw is, the angle of the jaw, where the, you know, all the different planes. I'm not going to go into Latin. I almost, I'm going to start doing, you know, teacher lecture Latin, because uh, of all the anatomy. But because I studied, I know where those bones uh, go, where all that that information goes. So I, after I have my mass of the head, I could I could literally sketch in parts. And I don't have to keep any of this information. This is, and I don't do this normally when I'm drawing. I immediately draw the blob, and then I start doing uh, other stuff. One thing that the handbook didn't get into is. Um, so the eye is a steer sitting inside the, the socket of the skull. And at the back point of the skull, there's these two holes in the eye. This model actually gets them across pretty good. Right? See those holes? Those holes. Okay. That's where all your optic nerves go through. Right through into the back there. So your eyeball is actually sitting well inside that socket for the most part. You know, really cartoony how they do this. Okay. Um, no pupil, fine. So the pupils are in the back. So your eyeballs, for all intents and purposes, might might as well be on a flattened board inside your skull. See that up there, right? I could resist. Uh, but when they rotate, they're being pulled by the muscles there. So when they're looking, 
good looking there. Put that, put him in a skull. I'm probably making this far too busy. God, that looks nightmarish. I shouldn't have just impromptu dropped into like doing the eyes on the board thing. It's much, much, much better when I draw bigger. Anyway, so. Uh, these eyes are sitting in the board, so when they turn, um, they don't move physically. They just rotate um, as as the parts on the eye, the muscle tissue, as these contract, they can, they, if this contracts on the there, the eye's going to look down. If this contracts, pull the eye up. This will look up, or if this contracts in here, or any variation on that. And that's what moves the eye around. The eye is locked in place. It's just the pupil moving around on the sphere. Now, you might think this is a terribly messy way to work. Well, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, that's why I work on bond paper. Like when I'm doing all my preliminary studies and everything, I'm working on this translucent bond paper that I'm drawing on now. And I have no idea what I'm drawing yet either. This is honestly the most fun of drawing class would be like when I just start drawing something. Like what the fuck, what the hell am I drawing? So the number of things I'm, I'm playing to, after I got the shape done, after the shape is down, all I'm doing is breaking things down into the level of portions I need to get all the features sitting in the proper place in a head shape that I drew. I can change the head shape as I go. I can give like a more prominent forehead. Thicker neck muscles. Um, I can move the hairline everywhere. And if you do this long enough, you start learning the other anatomy and all the other proportional elements that go there, go into all of this. And, and, and it's really helpful. Um, the more you know, the more you can retain in your head, the less you have to objectively think about before adding, um, the faster everything begets, uh, gets, begets, gets. Um, uh, and let's let's get into why I like working on Bond. So that head's not terrible. It's not a great head. I'm not like I didn't draw with any sort of intention. I find like just drawing randomly reduces the odds greatly on, on getting a good quality drawing out of it. Um, here I have a basic head. Not in love with the uh, features. All right, so sharper. Um, I like these pencils a lot. They're they're not cheap, but I like them. All right, so let's um, 
I have a basic structured head. It looks a little bit like a, I don't know, a Russian lobster right now. But uh, let's let's bring it closer to because all the features are there. I can move things around. Trace around the eye, but I'm gonna make the eye a little smaller. Since all the information is there from the previous sketch, I don't have to uh, put much information down again. Now I'm just deciding what I'm going to keep when I'm not. So you super prominent cheekbones are. One downside of these uh, matte pencils is I think the binder in them is a little wax, almost like a Conte binder, which uh, makes them a little harder to erase clean. to guess the two lessons. So yeah, that's, that's just a quick head sketch from a mass. And you can you can do the exact same thing with uh, women. Um, and I'll mention we got, we got 13 mats. I think I can do quick women headshot. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to sharpen the pencil again because look how quickly they lose their tint. So if I'm if I'm driving a woman, uh, I'm generally doing the same thing, but I'm mindful in all the lessons I've learned uh, drawing women over the years, either from life or from imagination. Start with a simple mass. On the center line going up the front, turning the head. And the side plane of the head. Brow line, eye line, nose, mouth. Hair. I know why I'm covering her face with so much hair. That's a pretty slack face. I'm just probably rushing it because I'm mindful of the time. Um, I haven't needed the razor one. It just looks better than the, the other one. I find that eyes wander too much and that cheekbone get obfuscated. Yeah, so neither the eraser works better than the regular eraser here. Alright, uh, so. That's the one downside to like just doing a quick block construction is if you have a fundamental mistake in your assumption of the initial structure underneath your blob, uh, you're going to have to do some redrawing. Generally speaking though, it's going to be faster. I don't know why I chose to draw a Dutch angle on a face here.
I just realized I should probably put some clothing on. Yeah, so again, it's just a quick, quick uh, approach to drawing heads um, from basically a blob and memorized proportions. So I will go in the future, I will do specific step-by-step -step processes to draw better heads uh, in more of a classing as opposed to an impromptu display. But um, yeah, so I think, uh, huh, should I do it? I, I, I just realized I've got like a few more minutes left. I have time to like redraw that one. I rushed it, I rushed it too much. My fingers are all filthy from the, the pencil. So those so quickly, but all right. So mistakes I made, I dropped the ice turbo here. The ice should be higher. Uh, I seem to have lost what's going to be more of that. So her eyes should actually be up there. This is fine where it is, as long as I understand where her eyes are. So you can see how far off, like if I'm placing the eyes up here, then this eye was higher than that eye, which was part and parcel for me, like drawing a weird angle on the head. And not placing the construction stuff, which is which is one of the things I'd, I'd want to get into uh, when I'm actually teaching about head construction. In that, some sometimes, um, even though you can do the block construction for like a straight on shot, three quarter shot, whatever you want, pretty easily, um, the moment you start dealing with weird twisty angles, your proportions have a higher chance of falling off. So uh, in those cases, like if I was doing this for an actual comic page after, if the head didn't look right from my layout stage to my pencil stage, I would literally either, I'd either find photo reference of a head, doesn't that male from the head, uh, in, in the same uh, position, so I can get the perspective on the head and then just make changes I need for um, male-female differences. Uh, or I'd, I'd actually do a block construction along the lines of Bridgman, um, supported with a little bit of Loomis uh, in terms of like getting some of those angles right. You know, there's eyes still floating, but I'm not in love with it. Once your head's like that on that angle, this is me showing you my ass here on live TV for live streaming. Uh, so standard cloud and that would be there. This would be tightened up like that. So that shoulder would probably drop. It's probably standing for contrapposed out as well. So this shoulder would be elevated and it should be like standard hip. So it would be like, yeah. Um, then the head goes back. Look, look, oh my god, look how bad I got this hair over here. Now I'm just spending a little bit more time actually thinking about this head. I'm going, ooh, bad start. I should have actually, you know, drawn this head beforehand, had it just off camera. <laughs> Cheat. Yeah, this is already better. It's still not what I, I, I just wouldn't pass for me for like in, a, in an issue of a comic or something.
the next third line in there. Yeah, so this is just a just literally live demonstration of, of rushing through things and not doing the construction work. Even even after all these years, I will still, you know, I'll still screw up. Um, I don't think any artist uh, doesn't. I, 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 if, if it ever stops for any artist, don't let me know. Um, I don't want to get depressed and realize that here I am in my 50s and I, I, I haven't gotten rid of all my mistakes yet. Well, some other people might have. All right, well, uh, that's an hour, uh, more or less, and um, a bunch of head sketches, and uh, again, just, just to wrap up, I think if you have a young artist in your life, uh, if you have a young artist in your life, and you want to give them a good tool for drawing, I, I cannot recommend Drawing a Head and Figure by Jack Ham enough. Um, that said, he also has um, a number of other books. Uh, I find his How to Draw Animals book pretty good. Um, it's still like drawing, drawing scenery. I don't know if they're in print anymore. Um, are, again, very valuable for the beginning artist. If you have experience um, um, with still lifes or drawing scenery, um, it might even be too basic for you. And I don't, I'm not a fan of Jack Ham's cartooning. Um, it's, it's got, the book has got, I used to own it. The book's got good information, um, but it's not, it's so out of date stylistically. I don't know how much value you would have for a contemporary young artist. So, yeah. So next week I'll do something similar to this unless a commission comes in. Uh, if you want to do a commission, you reach out to, uh, you go to the website, cadencecomicart.com. Um, they're my art rep. You go to the commissions uh, tab and my commission's standing open for doing live drawings like this. Um, if nothing comes in for next week, I will either do some of my professional work on live, well, I, I have to ask permission, of course, or I will do something else like this, talk about another art book I like and talk about another aspect of drawing that I want to get into. You guys have a great week. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. Apparently, I'm supposed to say that all the time. Um, apparently, I'm also supposed to have like little intercut moments where I play pre-recorded video talking about like 